Hey, it's NPR's Book of the Day. I'm Andrew Limbaugh. You know by now that we are highlighting books featured on Books We Love, NPR's guide to our favorite books this year. And one of the more vexing books on the list is Justin Torres's Blackouts. It's not a straightforward read intentionally, you know, as it exposes the holes in our history when it comes to the life and accomplishments of queer people. In this interview with NPR's Ari Shapiro, Torres talks about how frustrating it is that all these queer people have had their stories disappeared and how writing this book was a way of mimicking that frustration. That's after the break. This message comes from NPR sponsor Solgar. As people age, cellular function declines, which may impact changes in energy and strength. Solgar Cellular Nutrition is a holistic collection of cellular nutrients formulated to help fight cellular decline and promote cell health. Learn more at CellularNutrition.Solgar.com. These statements have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. This product is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. This message is from NPR sponsor Osea. This holiday season, give the gift of glow with Osea's limited edition Super Glow Body Set. This three-piece kit has everything they need to exfoliate, hydrate, and glow all over and is sure to please. For a gift that will impress, give Osea's Super Glow Body Set. Right now, you can get the Super Glow Body Set valued at $126 for just $79 when you use code GIFT at OSEAMalibu.com. Which histories do we share and teach, and which ones do we ignore or hide? Politicians and school boards are debating these questions all over the country. And these questions are also at the heart of the new novel, Blackouts. The author Justin Torres became a breakout literary star for his first novel, We the Animals. And now Blackouts has just been named a finalist for the National Book Awards. Justin Torres, welcome to All Things Considered, and congratulations. Thanks so much. I'm delighted to be here. I haven't been able to stop thinking about this book since I read it. You weave together fiction and history, and it's never totally clear where the line is. So I want to start with the actual history. This book has cameos from Andy Warhol, Emma (laughs) Goldman, even Martin Scorsese. But the central historical character, Jan Gay, is not well known. Who was she? Yes, she was this amazing lesbian researcher and activist who understood that getting stories out there about queer lives and about lesbian lives in the 20s and 30s and 40s, when these stories weren't being told, would would be kind of instrumental in changing public attitudes. And so she went to Europe, she interviewed all these lesbians there and in New York, and she took down these case histories, and she went and tried to get the cover of a medical expert, because otherwise the, the work would never be published. Hmm. And then what ended up happening was the her research was kind of stolen from her and turned against her, really. She was blacked out, in a sense. Yeah, exactly, exactly, yeah. How did you first learn about her? I found this book called Sex Variance, a Study in Homosexual Patterns that was published in 1941. And I was working in a bookstore and somebody brought in a box of donations. And there were books like John Genet and Radcliffe Hall and these these texts that I recognized as these kind of pre-Stonewall queer texts and then this medical study. And it was fascinating and really disturbing. Like there were a lot of very pathological language about homosexuality as a social disease. And there was also this really careful documentation of the first-person testimonies that the people were telling about their sex lives and their family lives. And I was so fascinated. I'm like, somebody involved in this clearly paid very close attention. So the name on that book, Sex Variants, A Study in Homosexual Patterns, was a psychiatrist, a man, George W. Henry, who co-opted the work of Jan Gay How did you find out about the unacknowledged author behind the author? There was a couple books that mentioned the sex variance study, and one of them was called Departing from Deviance, and another was called An American Obsession. And in those two books, both of them kind of dive into the the story of Jan Gay in like the footnotes and, and some of it in the direct text. And so I just started researching like, oh, here's this hidden history, and can I tell more about her story? And then I found out I kind of couldn't. <laughs> you couldn't? There just wasn't much more to find than what these people... Hmm. I mean, I'm not also I'm also not a professional scholar of medical history. So. And, and so you imagine the gaps. You fill in the gaps. You tell us Jan Gay's story in the form of 
a dialogue between two characters in the present or the more recent past. There's this unnamed young man, a narrator caring for a dying old man named Juan. And Juan tells the young man about Jan Gay's history. And so readers get this sort of Russian nesting doll's story within a story. Why did you frame Jan Gay's story that way with all of the potential for subjectivity and distortions that can come with a game of telephone? Yeah, I think because that was my experience of of diving into history, right? Like I, I had this desire to tell her story and then this frustration about the ways in which certain people's stories and histories are suppressed. And so I wanted to mimic that frustration in the text itself. And so Juan is somebody who knew Jan and knows a lot about her story, but also there are so many gaps that he can't fill. And so they imagine their way into those gaps. They start just making up a story of her life. The book is so multimedia. The experience of reading it is like no book I've ever read. (laughs) There are photographs, illustrations, handwritten letters. At the back of the book, there's something I've never seen before, which is two sets of endnotes. There (laughs) is blinkered endnotes with context from the fictional narrator's perspective, and then illustration credits that say like, oh, this is from the Library of Congress. Mm -hmm. Um, What did you want the reader to experience as they engage with all of these different artifacts and art forms and layers of meaning? Yeah, I mean, I think that one of the things that I find troubling about writing about the queer past or stigmatized histories in general is you run into so much pathology and you run into so much, all this ephemera, these photographs, these letters, things that you don't quite know how to make sense of or how to put into context. There are images of book pages where almost all of the text has been blacked out and what remains becomes a sort of poem. What did you have in mind as you were creating these these blackouts? I'm assuming you created them. I did, yeah, yeah, I did. I mean, I, I keep that ambiguous in the book, but I'm I'm proud to own up to it now. <laughs> so what were you doing as you did that? My first impulse with these testimonies was to make all these people into characters. There's there's 80 participants in the study, 40 men and 40 women, and I wanted to I wanted to like recuperate their stories and and I quickly realized that it wasn't going to work. It couldn't work that way, right? Yeah. That what Just I actually, too much. Yeah, and, and what, what I had was this text that was coming from these deviant studies, right? Like, I didn't have these people. I didn't have their stories. I had this... Pathologized version. Pathologized version, exactly. And so... I just started trying to... One day, I just started making photocopies of the book and just blacking out things that I, you know, like that bothered me. (laughs) And then that turned into, well, what if instead of just trying to like redact what I find offensive, what if I just try and make the text say something else? So that rather than recuperating, I'm it's a third kind of interpretation. It's such an interesting challenge as a writer that like you set out in so many different ways to portray omission, to portray (laughs) erasure. It's like how do you show the absence of something? And you do it in all of these different ways throughout the book. Yeah, I mean, there, this might sound incredibly pretentious, but Keats has this idea of negative capability, which is being able to sit with ambiguity and not trying to make everything clear. And 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 I think that I wanted to keep things ambiguous uh-huh. and 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 have the reader just sit there in that ambiguity. So I asked you what we lose when these stories are blacked out, mm-hmm. but what do we gain by remembering them through fiction? where you deliberately blur the line between what's real and what's imagined. I mean, I hope that reading a book like this triggers curiosity in the reader. I hope that that you're just like, I need to learn more about Jenga. I need to learn more about Edna Thomas. I need to learn more about, you know, Puerto Rican syndrome or, or all of these things that I touch on in the book. Yeah, Puerto Rican and, syndrome is a whole other conversation that blew my mind, <laughs> but we'll save that for another day. Yeah, totally. Um, but but I, I hope that, that there's this curiosity that gets sparked, and and that, I think, is what fiction can do, right? It, it can give you this kind of sense of being deeply enmeshed in the narrative potential of the, of the past and the way that the past is speaking to the present moment. Justin Torres, his new novel is Blackouts. Thank you so much for talking with me about it. Thanks, Ari. There's no one I want to talk to more on NPR than you. On the next Do Line from NPR, 
the origins of Hamas, the context in which it developed, and what it represents to Palestinians, Israelis, and the rest of the world. Listen to Throughline wherever you get your podcasts. The following message comes from NPR sponsor Mass Mutual. The Mass Mutual Foundation empowers local nonprofits to increase financial resilience in their communities. Board member Dorothy Varon explains why access to networks is key. One of the primary ways in which we think the work of the foundation can support that notion of mutuality is by supporting projects, organizations who help us activate that connecting of people to not just the financial resources, but that can help groups of people learn about opportunities to be educated, to have networking opportunities they wouldn't otherwise have. It's all about getting people connected to the things that will help them break through barriers and avoid financial calamity in the event of a small financial hit. To learn more about the Mass Mutual Foundation and their community-led partnerships, visit massmutual.com slash foundation.